all around the world get the same joy, the same wonder, the same splendor, the same gasp of excitement just by looking at these things. And as long as the narrator figure doesn't get between you and the animal too often, you're okay. <laughs> There's been a few of those instances, David. Um, for many years, though, as a, a TV presenter at least, you, you held back a bit from speaking quite publicly about environmental issues. Is, um, was there a reason you decided to do that? Um, well, when I, I started 60 years ago, in the middle, mid, the mid 50s, and to be truthful, I don't think there was anybody in the, in the mid 50s who thought that there was a danger that we might annihilate part of the natural world. There were animals that were in danger, that's true. Um, and there were animals that we could see, if we didn't do something, they were going to become extinct. Uh, and the notion that, that human beings might exterminate a whole species uh, was a slightly, um, I wouldn't say a, alarming one, you just hadn't thought about it. And if it did occur, as it did with the Arabian Norix, for example, it seemed the exception. Uh, now, of course, and we are only too well aware that the whole of the natural world is at our disposal, as it were, that we, we, ha we can do things accidentally that exterminate the whole area of, of, of the natural world and the species that live within it. Mm, of course. So is there um, sort of one particular reason or several reasons why you decided to change your mind about this and have started to make some more um, bold conservation films? Yes, uh, and of course, if you were a sensitive naturalist, uh, you would recognize that there were areas, we, we began to recognize that there were areas in which um, uh, this animal may have disappeared or that man may have disappeared. Um, but the, the notion that humanity might exterminate a whole community of animals was, was quite foreign. I, I, I don't think many people thought of that. And, it, and of course, um, the naturalists uh, were the exception in a way. They were people with their eyes open, their sensitive tentacles it, it, prepared to, to see what was happening around them. But you know, now there are more people living in, in towns and conurbations than they're living in the wild. So it means that the majority of the human race are out of touch to some degree with the richness of the natural world. And um, so uh, what they see on television is uh, new to them, but at the same time, people who watch the natural world on television uh, get a vision of the world that no human beings ever had 100 years ago. A hundred years ago, people didn't know anything about the world. They knew about their uh, immediate circumstances, and of course, they, they need book, they read books and so on. But now television can take them to the bottom of the sea, and they can take them high in the sky, and they can take them into the Arctic and the coldest regions and on the top of the Himalayas, everywhere, and you can see the most remote things. And David, recently you were, you were in Poland. You spoke very powerfully at the UN Climate Change. Uh, conference there. Tell everyone here, how, how urgent is that crisis now? It's difficult to overstate it. Um, we are now so numerous, so powerful, so all-pervasive, the mechanisms that we have for destruction are so wholesale and so frightening that we can actually just exterminate whole ecosystems without even noticing it. We have now to be really aware of the dangers of what we're doing. Falling damage upon marine life, the extent of which we don't yet fully know. And why do you think the, sort of the world leaders and those in, in, in uh, key positions of leadership, why do you think they've taken so long and there have been quite a few faltering steps uh, to act on environmental challenges? Because the connection between... Um, the natural world and the urban world, the society of human society, has always, um, since the Industrial Revolution, has been remote and widening. Uh, and we didn't realize the effects of what we were doing uh, out there. But now we are seeing that almost everything we do has its echoes and has its uh, duplications and inter implications across the natural world, so that we have now really to care for what we do. 
because we can exterminate things without even knowing. And as you've alluded to in some of your films, David, there are great sources of medicinal products and all sorts of things out there that we've, we still don't know about. And there are still many species that we don't know about, some that we will never know about because they may be disappeared from the planet. That, that is so. And, and, and uh, it may seem that, that when we say, oh, well, this and all that bird or that mammal uh, is rare and ought to be protected, um, People say, well, yes, is that just the naturalist saying it's a luxury or a pleasure or um, uh, is, is it really important? Are you really sure? Uh, the problem about extermination of species is that the natural world of which we are a part is ex incredibly complex and it has connections all over the place and you damage one and you can never tell where the damage is going to end up through, because of all those broken connections. And if you break all of them, then suddenly the whole fabric collapses and you get eco-disaster. I mean, to give a, a particular example, um, in the early 19th, 20th century, uh, the sea otter on the Pacific had the most luxurious fur that human beings had ever come across. So, of course, you hunt sea otters. And then suddenly you began to realize that actually sea otters were getting rarer and rarer, and they were on the verge of extinction. At the same time, but a second group of people saw that the seas around the Pacific Ocean, up on the Pacific Northwest, of, uh, the Pacific Ocean, the food fish were getting scarcer. And it didn't seem there was any connection between the two. But actually, sea otters uh, prey upon sea urchins. Sea urchins um, actually live on the floor of the sea and they eat small sea algae, fucus. So if they eat all that, the forests disappear. If the forests disappear, the, f the young fish, hatchlings, actually normally live in, th in that forest and hatchlings from outside in the ocean, the Pacific, they suddenly begin to disappear, knock out the sea otters, and in fact the, the consequence is loss of fertility in the sea oceans of fish upon which we might wish to live. So it's an example of the complexity, and there are many much more complex uh, relationships within the natural world than that one. So that a healthy natural world is absolutely essential for human society. And like you say, the, the, the chain is so delicate, isn't it? And that if you pluck out some of these gaps without realizing what you're doing, the, the consequences, the repercussions go for generations. Yes. Yeah. And talking of generations, people of my generation now are beginning to step into positions of leadership around the world. The work to save the planet is probably largely going to happen on our watch. What advice do you have for my generation? And, and what, what can we build on that you have started? I think um, the paradox that there has never been more a time when more people have been out of touch with the natural world um, than is now. And we have to recognize that every breath of air we take, every mouthful of food that we take comes from the natural world. And that if we damage the natural world, we damage ourselves. We are one coherent ecosystem. It's not just a question of beauty or interest or wonder. Uh, it's the essential ingredient, the essential part of human life is a healthy planet. We are in the danger of wrecking that. If we don't recognize the sort of connections that I've been describing, uh, then the whole of the planet becomes in hazard and we are destroying the natural world and with it ourselves. So turning specifically to the people in this room, uh, here in front of us, David, what, uh, bear in mind they're all leaders in their particular field. What is your message, if you have a particular message, what is your message to them? Care for the natural world. Not only care for the natural world, uh, but treat it with a degree of respect and reverence. 
Uh, the natural world is, as I've said, the source of, of all wonder, and our future, we're, we're bound up together. Uh, the, that the future of the natural world is in our hands. We have never been more powerful. We can wreck it with ease. We can wreck it without even noticing that we're doing it. And if we wreck the natural world, in the end, we wreck ourselves. In our daily lives, I suppose the thing that I really care for, just in ordinary daily lives, is, is not to waste the, 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 uh, the, the riches of the natural world on which we depend. It's not just energy, which of course is very important, uh, but it's also dealing with the natural world with a degree of respect, not to throw away food, not, not to throw away power, just care for the natural world of which we are an essential part. Okay. And there's obviously there's a connection between environmentalism, capitalism, and economic success, isn't there? Between? Uh, environmentalism, capitalism, and economic success. Yes. I think that's quite an interesting sort of topic that the audience here would find very interesting. That's why this particular event and this particular day, as far as I'm concerned, is, is one of the most optimistic things I've seen for a very long time. This, this disaster, this creeping disaster, which has overtaken the world and is in the danger of really damaging it beyond repair, it started um, in Britain uh, in the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. And uh, in, in developing nations, to the natural world at the stage, as it did in America, seemed to be, uh, as it were, there to be conquered. A terrible word, to conquer the natural world. We have to get out there and show our mastery of it and destroy it in the process. And that had underlay the human reaction to the natural world for a very long time and still is seen by some people that in fact humanity and industrialized humanity in particular is in opposition to the natural world. It is not. We are all one world and that is the important thing that we have to recognize and which organizations like this and events like this give you the optimism of feeling that that, that fact, that fundamental beautiful fact is now being recognized. That is, is why it is so exciting to be at this great important occasion where people attending it have more power perhaps than any other gathering in the world. And that, then the feeling that those responsible for this gathering recognize this fundamental truth and that people who come here will actually not only recognize it, but do something to make sure that that pact between the natural world and humanity is given uh, its proper place and honor. You use the word optimism there, David, quite a few times. Do you feel the narrative around climate change and environmentalism sometimes can be quite pessimistic and that actually there is a real need for injection of optimism? In a sense, I, I shrink from saying either an optimist or a pessimist. I mean, what good does it do to say you're pessimistic? That is not the point. The point is that we have this option ahead of us. We have to take the option of protecting the natural world. And we are discovering more ways in which we can do so. Um, I, I am hearing all around, of, yes, we can do this, we can help that, and so on. Uh, the fact that we are now actually beginning to get power directly from the sun and the other renewables and that we can see that there's no longer any need for us to pollute the world uh, of, of, uh, of, of our devices for generating energy, that we can do that is becoming reality all over Europe, all over the world. Um, and that's where the future lies. When one looks at the consequences of, of what we've done to the natural world in the processes of raising energy, we no need longer need to. So there's a source of great optimism there. We have the power, we have the knowledge, uh, actually, to live in harmony with nature. And the world came together in uh, the Paris Agreement to tackle climate change. But specifically in 2020, uh, in Beijing, you and others were seeking a, a global deal for nature. Lots of people here probably haven't heard of, uh, about that, David. Do you mind telling us why, why specifically that is so important? Well, because Paris 
Paris was a, a recognition by um, nations around the world um, that we ha the natural world and humanity are, are interdependent. And Paris recognized what the dangers were, and they saw the problems about rising temperatures, about how climate, we have influenced the climate and caused appalling de devastation uh, with, with rising temperatures, and how it was paramount importance that we stop doing it, which we can do, we know how to do it, and the, the a determination of the, natures, of, of the nations around the world that we should do it, and try and limit it, what well, we said, in between two, uh, two degrees and, and one and a half degrees, average around the world. If we can do that, we can prevent loss of coral reefs, we can prevent all sorts of damages, we can reduce the extremes of weather that's overtaking the planet already, and it, that is essential for the future well-being of the planet. That was recognized by nations around the world, not universally, I have to say, and there have been people who have with, with, wished to withdraw from that. But nonetheless, the majority of the nations around the world have accepted that and recognized towards that. And that's where we must put our faith. And David, you're, um, you're specifically narrating a new landmark series called Our Planet. And you've worked with WWF, uh, Silverback Films, and Netflix. Why did you decide to become involved in this particular project? Because the issue has never been more important. And the issue that it should be recognized in not just one part of the world, not just in Europe, but worldwide, um, and, and the World Wildlife Fund uh, gave us facilities to see the work that they've been doing, the researches they've been doing, the knowledge they've got been doing about the way in which ecosystems are working and where there are dangers and where there are wonders to enable us to produce this, this series of films. Um, and by putting it on Netflix, it becomes possible uh, uh, overnight uh, you can reach 150 million people immediately. I mean, I started television in television in the 1950s, and television in, in Britain at that time was only seen by a few million people uh, in southern England. Uh, now, with Netflix, it's possible to put on a transmission, and it is seen worldwide by hundreds of millions of people, and will go on being seen available when people, word of mouth, did you see that show? It's still there. It's still able for them to see it. So this is a way which the World Wildlife Fund recognized and gave us all the insights and the information, the practical help that we needed to make these programs. Um, and it, so the Worldwide Fund for Nature is worldwide. And this picture of the world will be coming worldwide, simultaneously on one particular date and remain there. And if, you, if I made you choose, David, which I'm gonna do, it, would this be one of your most favorite projects or your most um, enjoyable in terms of actually what they've created, how they've filmed it, what, what's been shown, and, and bear in mind the time it's being shown in, in the world with the issues that are going on? Yes, I mean, I started when it was just me and the, and the cameraman and, and, the, and the clockwork camera. Yeah. Um, you don't make natural history films like that anymore. Um, the natural history films now of this sort of quality are made by literally hundreds of people. There may be 30, there may be 50 cameramen who'll be working on one particular program. I think something like 300 cameramen have worked on the series as a whole. Uh, because now you've got the facilities to go up in the skies and the bottom of the seas. And you've got, you can trek over the, uh, over the polar wastes. You can go over the deserts. You can be in the jungles of the world. And all those pictures you can bring back in order to give a unique picture, which human beings haven't seen until this generation. Yeah. And uh, I think you've chosen a favorite clip from our planet, which we're going to show in a second. Can you just tell us a bit about what we're going to see in the footage? The footage of the glacier. Um, one of the most immediate dangers that are facing the planet today is, of course, rising temperatures. And uh, where you may see that, of course, is, is actually more up in the north than it is in the south. And in the Arctic, the Arctic is temperatures rising very, very fast. And how we, the, the team who made this series determined, of course, that they would needed pictures of, of, of the melting ice that would symbolize this. 
uh, and they went up to the north. Now the glaciers uh, in the, in, in, uh, up in the north, in the Arctic, um, are moving very fast. Uh, and they went to one particular glacier, uh, knowing that it was advancing into the sea rather fast. Uh, but you need, glaciers are always on the move a bit, but you need dramatic sea uh, uh, event. They're a bit like children, David, unpredictable. Yeah, <laughs> quite so. But they wanted to see the uh, glacier that was carving, that is to say, coming off in lumps. And they decided that the way they would see that best would be from the air and in a helicopter. They eventually, on the very last day of their, of their location, they were up in the helicopter and they spied the glacier suddenly beginning to carve. That there were uh, sections of the glacier the size of a skyscraper, of a great multi-storied building, falling into the water, causing huge surges. Now, you're a helicopter pilot. Is that tricky? It can be, David, yes. <laughs> I mean, huge uprushes of air uh, when the vast blocks fall into the sea. And, and what that does, and if, if you're a pilot, I mean, you will know uh, how you're going to get a steady shot to see that. The pilot who was working on that helicopter uh, has my imagination, and you would know much more, better than me how skilled he was to get the sort of shots of the carving of the glacier, which is included in this series. All helicopter pilots are very skillful, David. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I think everyone will be fascinated to, to see the clip now. So if we could play the clip, that'd be fantastic. These massive ice falls from the top of the glacier are just the beginnings of a far greater event. A stretch of the front face of the glacier over a kilometer long is starting to break away. From 400 meters beneath the surface, the hidden ice is surging upwards. skyscraper generates a colossal tidal wave. Within 20 minutes, 75 million tons of ice break free. In uh, incredible footage, I think everyone would agree. David, uh, it just remains me to say a huge thank you on behalf of everyone here for you being here today to talk um, so openly, and a huge congratulations again for winning the Crystal Award. A round of applause, please, for Sadeh Rappenborough.